It was good. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, our BACCF 2023 webinar, Adapting to Changes in Logistics, a vision of C-level executives. My name is Alexander Piquet. Good afternoon. I am the 2023 president of the BACCF and founder of the Piquet Law Firm. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar focusing on adapting to changes in logistics, a vision of C-level executives. Our speakers today are Jai Young, CEO of KCE Logistics, Mari Zaccarelli Mendes, president of ACME Alliance, ACME Alliance LLC, Lucas Nagai, managing director of Glory Global Solutions, and Davidson Rodriguez, managing director, Manuport Logistics. Our thanks to our partner efforts in putting this event together, and a special thank you to Edson Tamamaro from Tatsuo Consultoria, who put the workshop together, the Brazilian Consulate Chamber, the Brazilian Consulate General, uh, and our ambassador, André Odenbrach, which is the, the honorary president of the chamber, Ache USA, and Haya Trace. Any questions you may have throughout the, the presentation, kindly send by chat, and at the end of the presentations, we'll try and answer each question. The BACCF is working very hard to bring our member programs with vital content. We are excited to announce that we'll be starting our roadshow in Brazil on May 16th, going to Curitiba, Maringá, Londrina, Sao Paulo, Florianópolis, and Porto Alegre on the first leg. The second leg in June will visit cities in the north of Brazil, as well as Belo Horizonte and uh, Brasilia. Please be sure to visit the BACCF website or call our offices and we'll be delighted to speak with you about becoming further involved in our activities and our very uh, active committees. So we'll start with uh, um, vision uh, of, uh, from uh, managing director of Glory Solutions. <clears throat> Luca, Lucas Nagai, then we'll pass on to um, Managing Director of ACME, ACME Alliance, Mauri Zaccarelli, then a Managing Director at uh, Manuport, Davidson Rodriguez, then uh, least but not less, the vision from Managing Director of KCE, -K Jay Young, uh, and to finalize, we'll um, get the, and trying to answer the questions following the, the presentation, the Q&A. Um, and at one o'clock, we'll try to uh, end this on time. So uh, we don't take uh, any more of uh, everybody's precious time. So let's uh, make sure we enjoy the event. Thank you very much. And let's start with uh, Lucas Nagai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Look. you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Guy. Let me just set up a little bit. Okay. I'll pin you here and you're on. Can you guys, let me share my screen real quick. Are you being able to see my screen? Not yet. Yes. Not yet. Yes or no? No. I, I see Not you. Yet. Huh? I can okay. see you, but I cannot see your presentation. Oh, right. Right. no. Now is, now is ready. Okay. Let me just set up. Just. Can you see? Can I go ahead? Yes. You go. Okay. So first of all, Alexandre, thank you very much. Uh, I deeply appreciate uh, the invitation from the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce of Florida and also um, Edson Tamamaro. And for me, it's it's a pleasure also to share the, the virtual stage with Mauri, uh, Davidson and Jay. So just to start with, my name is Lucas Nagai. I'm Brazilian. I'm currently uh, based in Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm father of two, Felipe, three, and also Beatrice. She's just uh, uh, turned one uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the managing director of Glory Brazil. I've been in the company for seven years and uh, serving as managing director for four. And I live here my 
my LinkedIn contacts in case anybody wants to to uh, hit me out or in case of doubt, more than happy to uh, to share and connect. So just uh, to start with uh, talking about Glory, we are a, a Japanese uh, multinational company. We have a presence, uh, whether directly or uh, via partner network in over 100 countries. Um, we're pretty much virtually anywhere uh, where our customers do business and um, and the collective capability of our employees help us our customers to navigate the challenges uh, that they now face and as a result of the changing of the consumer behavior uh, we we have pretty much two uh, key verticals of our business uh, we are a leader on the cash handling uh, uh, machine business uh, supporting financial institution and also supporting uh, uh, the retail uh, uh, vertical i do believe that uh, the, the retailers will be the next uh, the next bank so we are investing and including we, we have made some strategic acquisitions in the past to support our growth market initiative in, in this vertical. We are also recognized as an industry leader um, by some of uh, holding some of numerous industrial awards uh, such as the RBR and also the Red Dot Design or some of them. So just uh, to provide you a little bit of our, our footprint uh, in the market that we are we're establishing, and like everybody, we also get uh, got hit and impacted by this supply chain disruption. And this is something that uh, I would like to start with. So talking about uh, the context that we are living today, right? Uh, back in time, we were talking about the VUCA world, and now uh, we're talking about the Benny world, and uh, uh, which is relies from bridal, uh, incomprehensible, nonlinear, and also anxious. So on my presentation, the idea is to connect this how the bridal anxious uh, connect on not only uh, showing the benefits of a supply chain resilience, as well as how um, we can build a, a, a supply chain resilience as well. So starting with the B, right? Uh, the bridal is, is that nowadays we cannot rely on something that it's, it's bridal or, or frail, right? So it may break down of the blue. Uh, this is something that what has happened with the, the COVID-19, uh, which is, is despite was like a, a black swan. Uh, this is something that uh, considering that nowadays the world which we live in is, is everything is interconnected. Um, a disastrous failure like it's happening with the COVID uh, impact and cause of the ripple effect uh, all over the planet. And, um, and this is something that, uh, that we live in today. And then afterwards, we get the, this war on Ukraine and that's interesting. That's just something that is more to come, right? And this is, this is uh, I guess this backdrop, uh, the obvious consequence is that the next letter on the Benny is the A, which stands for anxious, right? So uh, if you are anxious, uh, you will also feel helpless or unable to make decisions. And this is something that, uh, that we have seen, right? So uh, um, in an anxious world, people tend to watch for the, what the next disaster to happen or tend to become more passive to avoid potentially a wrong decision uh, taking or altogether. Uh, the end, uh, it's nonlinear. So things the way the, with the logical that we approach a decision taking back in time, uh, it's not quite a uh, fit together today, right? And also the AI, which is comprehensible, it's uh, such a, a nonlinear results of any given cause events or even decisions often seem to be a lacking kind of, uh, of a logical purpose. So that's why this, it becomes incomprehensible. So at the end of the day, what we see is that if, if, we, there's, if uh, we, there's something that is bright, it requires capacity and resilience. And that's why I would like to focus on the resilience. If it's something that if we feel anxious, at the end of the day, we need uh, empathy and mindfulness. Um, the, the, if something is nonlinear, uh, we should call for context and have the ability to adapt ourselves. And if something that is comprehensible, it, it will demand from us transparency and a lot of intuition to manage it uh, with, this new, uh, with this new scenario. So said that, uh, what are the benefits and how can, we, how can a supply chain resilience be built inside organizations? But before I get to into, the, into this slide, I think it's important to, to set the tone and, uh, and answer what is actually a supply chain resilience, right? So at the end of the day, the concept uh, is it's pretty much a company's ability to navigate an expected supply chain disruption with its existing capabilities. So in another word, supply chain resilience is the, is the ability to react 
to problems and recovering from them without significant impact to operations and customer timelines. Uh, so taking advantage of that, uh, the benefits of having a, a, a resilient supply chain at the end of the day is competitive advent advantage. I think on the past years, even when we have significant uh, opportunities on the table and, and, and working with the sales team and also with our headquarters, getting the approval, one thing that also always pop it out is that uh, when we were mapping like a competitive landscape was their ability to have the, 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 the device or that we sell on stock, right? So this has become a very good competitive advantage on the past years, right? And also uh, data that I pulled out from McKinsey report, supply chain disruption costs average of 45% of years uh, profit and, um, and also uh, the gross profit growth that can be generated, uh, having a resilience leaders uh, outpaced that was that laggards by 55%. So I think this is this is a key driver uh, to bring and put together this competitive advantage. One thing that we we understood that those that uh, those companies that have been able to capture this this uh, advantage is their ability to invest before they actually need it, right? Uh, on the other hand, how can we build such kind of, uh, of resilience? So uh, I will focus on uh, on next slides, but it's pretty much having a more holistic approach. By uh, by the first one is by absorbing the the, the impact of a disruption uh, by better handling stocks, network design, sourcing strategy, including product design. This is something that, for instance, in Glory, what we did when we got some some key components uh, uh, supply chain disruption. Uh, the engineer team in Japan, they, they focus themselves to how we could re-engineer, always keeping the quality since we're a premier brand. Uh, but this is something that also to redesign, try to think outside the box to kind of like in case of emergency, we could uh, have a fast reply uh, to offset such kinds of disruptions and also recover. So our ability, how, how, how fast can we react uh, when disruption occurs? And this, is re this relies a lot of data-driven uh, uh, um, AI uh, uh, to support uh, such kind of uh, start work with more predictive approach uh, instead of a reactive approach. So uh, continuing, I think we, in terms of the, the landscape moving forward, uh, uh, I tend to agree that we do not expect uh, 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 um, such room for improvement, uh, especially uh, on on key on key pillars uh, such as the macroeconomic. So there's a volatile demand. Uh, some of them they understand that uh, the world is getting into technical recession already. So this will have uh, impact on capacity, inventory shrinkage. At the end of the day, inventory is, is working capital. Uh, also, the 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 high interest rate has been impacting significantly. So like I said before, we have a very clear go-to-market go to, to penetrate the retail market space. And here in Brazil, for instance, uh, since the retailer is a, is a leveraged business, they have been struggling a lot. Some of them already filed for restructuring and et cetera. So this is something that they are, they, they are struggling. Then it's, it's, it's impacting everybody that is, is tackling such kind of segment. Also, uh, there's some higher costs and inflation as well. Uh, from a ge uh, geopolitical standpoint, uh, increases the power of tension leading uh, to trade actions, not on tariffs, military sanctions. So this is also, uh, um, it's not uh, something that will make the supply chain uh, uh, worldwide more friendly, is the opposite. So this is something that it's, it's on the table and, and it's, it's important to take into consideration. And from operational standpoint, right, like natural disasters, uh, uh, the pandemics. So one thing that uh, that has been impacting and also has been fortifying our value proposition is this labor shortage, especially on on uh, United States and Europe. This is something that uh, that we 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 have been able to take advantage because at the end of the day we sell we sell automation to our customers and better customer experience and etc. So this is something that uh, that's also on the pipeline. So at the end of the day, uh, we must get uh, as a leaders we must get ourselves prepared. Uh, to be resilient and uh, uh, to all these unpredictable uh, future disruptions. 
so deep diving a little bit on on the concept and uh, like I said, to have this holistic approach is to understand the potential problems and quantify the magnitude of this potential exposure. So we have, when we're talking about recovery, it's pretty much the, con the continuous monitoring uh, using advanced analytics coupled with predicted algorithms. So it's very important to have like monitor sensing, uh, the predict modeling, uh, predicting algorithm to show how disruption could impact operation having, for instance, control tower to visualize end-to-end -end operations and also to identify potential disruption and also a crisis report, how we're gonna behave, uh, enable teams process and also have a playbook to optimize decision-making when you have like a, a, a disruption, right? And so this, is, this is relies a lot on visibility. So how can we create visibility across the network, right? Including multi-tier supplier mapping. So there's a lot of companies nowadays that, that they're, they, they, they relied a lot of their manufacturing in China, and now they're moving to a dual or multi-sourcing strategy, right? And also a quick view of changes in performance across uh, various KPIs. That uh, That's why requiring measures and all these this analytics is so key uh, on this approach towards recover. When I talk about absorb, and then uh, this is something that... Uh, prepare for events through network design and inventory planning. So do pretty much an assessment, identify potential exposures at part supplies, location and the product level. Like I said before, um, what can we do if we have a shortage in a specific part to re-engineer, to redesign, or even or even have a, a plan B on, on, on those high risk suppliers. Um, and also, start mapping out and prioritizing risks by quantifying the magnitude of likelihood this to happen. And if it happens, what the, what the action that must be taken to uh, mitigate such kind of disruption. So this is pretty much the holistic approach. And the idea now is to, to come together with some of ideas and, and some of the enablers uh, of building um, resilient capabilities and strength overall operations, organization and processes. So I tried to map it out and, and summarizing to, to four key drivers. So like I said, data analytics and tool. So to, to build a robust ecosystem of new tools to better anticipate risk and gain competitiveness. Also, there's a significant impact as, as a leader to learning and culture. So make sure that uh, we talk about the risk and resilience as a common place, like we do talk about cost and efficiency. Uh, leadership top managing decision making process. How we can we we base it on leveraging from those data provided. We can uh, take fast uh, uh, decisions. Process and operation module. So be flexible. Have redundancy on those key and more risky uh, uh, parts of the business and the supply chain. And also change management. I think on this this Benny word. I think this is something that enable a sustainable change on the way we do things. Right. So the way we do things in the past and be successful in the past does not guarantee that we're going to be successful in the future. So at the end of the day, I think I'm up on time. Uh, it, it's pretty much I would like to to show and present today. More than happy after the, all the presentations to to uh, uh, answer questions. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So now, Modi, you can go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you, uh, to all of you. I'm Maurice Zaccarelli Mendes. I'm the president and CEO of Acme Alliance. I'm in the manufacturing business for uh, 20 years, for more than 20 years, actually 23 years. And before I start sharing my view and thought about logistic disruptions in the last three years after COVID impact, I want to give you a brief background of Acme Alliance. Uh, I'm going to share with you a presentation of, of our company. And so I hope everybody can see that. And uh, Acme Alliance is a custom finished aluminum and zinc die casting company. We manufacture components for large OEMs on a, on a global scale. We own and operate uh, facilities in North America, South America, and Asia. Our plants share a global standard regarding to equipment, organizational structure, and capabilities. We supply several different markets, and I, I want to take this as an opportunity to share with you 
what we do and our customers and basically our, our, our customer base. Uh, we, we, we supply several different markets, as I said, automotive and heavy duty trucks, marine recreational products, gas dispensing, agriculture, small engines, and we are getting into new segments like solar energy components, EV, electric vehicles, and e-mobility. Uh, mainly EV and e-mobility are becoming very important for us, and we are putting a lot of efforts on those two specific markets. And I can tell you that it's been quite a challenge and, uh, and we have been uh, succeed on those. Um, on the following slides, we can have a better understanding uh, where our products uh, end up and the application of most of them. So uh, in the automotive industry, um, like some examples, of course, we supply many different ones, but water pump housing, oil filter housing, uh, in heavy truck industry, we supply housings for oil filters, brackets for engines, cooling system components, and several other ones. Uh, energy, that's a pretty good example that everybody sees when you stop by a gas station and we start refilling your car. Um, in, a, in, a, in the gas pump, and, uh, which we also call dispenser, right? We have many of our components, right? like the gas handles when you hold to, to, to refuel your car or inside of the gas pump. And we supply many different components. They are basically made out of aluminum and, uh, and we produce most of them since many years. Uh, marine industry, it's also a very important business for us and specifically uh, the outboard engines, right? Which mainly here in the United States, a huge business. And we supply several different components like the propeller, uh, crankcase, uh, prop shaft, and many other. So marine is quite a, a pretty important industry uh, for us in general. Agriculture and uh, recreational uh, industry, like mainly in Brazil and South America, agriculture has been growing uh, in a pretty high rate. And so for us in our uh, South America market, it's very important and we supply many different components for tractors, for construction uh, vehicles, and so on. And motorcycle industry, mainly in South America and North America, we, we supply uh, many different components. So as uh, all of you now have a better understanding about our business, where we are, uh, where we are located and what we do, I think we can focus now uh, on logistics, right? Which is the, the main topic for, for this event. Uh, the last three years have been very challenging uh, for the manufacturing industry in general, in general, mainly due to logistic issues causing a huge cost increase and significant delay to move products around the world. Among of a series of problems such as label shortage, uh, lockdowns, the cost of freight uh, hurt business across the globe. And uh, I tried to summarize what happened in the last uh, three years, and we can see that it was quite of a challenge uh, to overcome this. Uh, in two years, the cost to move a 40-foot container from Shanghai to, uh, to Los Angeles, for example, went up by around six times. Uh, and nevertheless, it was still uh, very hard to book it. Uh, as the main consequence of this insane increase and in lack of containers, the cost of consuming goods had a significant raise. So, uh, so how we uh, as a company, uh, based on this scenario, uh, react and, and overcome, overcome it. So, so how, how, how did we overcome this difficult situation? Uh, that, that's what I wanna share with you a little bit more about uh, who we are. Uh, since more than 20 years, we have embraced a regional production supply approach as our business model. What does it mean? Uh, it means that we try to supply locally, like our facility in Brazil supplies South America market. Our facility 
here in the US, out of Chicago, we supply basically, basically Canada, US, and Mexico. And the same in China, out of our factory in, in China, we supply Asia and part, uh, part of Europe. We strongly uh, believe that supply regionally shorten the, the, the extended value stream and we reduce inventories so we can react uh, much quicker. So that's our belief and our business model. For years, the traditional uh, sourcing method for most OEMs has been to seek the lowest component cost with little regard to the lowest total cost of ownership. We as a company think differently, right? Acme's model is based on total cost of ownership. We believe that being closer to our customers, we reduce lead time, inventory levels, transportation costs, which is basically the main subject for this uh, seminary, right? Transportation costs that what, what we saw in the last three years. We can also reduce uh, administrative costs to name a few. After COVID, our business model is even more appreciated uh, by our customers. And I, and I can say and tell you guys uh, in a very honest way, it saved our company, right? And um, we, 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 we took COVID as an opportunity to prove that our model works. For such a long time, since 2001 or two, we have been emphasizing this with our customers. And finally, with this disaster in the world, we could uh, prove that our, uh, our model uh, works. And again, more than ever, reaffirm our 20 years statement is fundamental. Acknowledge the statement, right? What we use to overcome the situation is our statement, focusing only on a component, component part price is a real danger. It works when everything is good. However, the second the global scale is disrupted, the consequences are serious. And we strongly believe on that. And we could see in the last three years what happened with the, with the supply chain all over the world. And, uh, and, um, and we, we, we can see here, uh, mainly in the US, people are trying hard and hard to bring the supply chain back to where you are located. So produce uh, locally and be close to your customers. That's what we strongly believe. And even though we are in different part of, parts of the world, we still believe that being close to the customer is the key for the success. And last but not least, I would say that the world supply chain needs balance. And we really hope this is the beginning of that change. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, Modi. Now, uh, Davidson, can you share your vision, please? Yes. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, let's say, everyone. It's, uh, thank you, Mauri, for, uh, for sharing your vision. Actually, it's uh, quite funny because a lot I'm going to say very much connects uh, to your uh, vision, to the way your company is, uh, let's say, uh, working. Basically, different than you, we are a service provider. So just before we go into the logistics, let's say, challenge of the future, we are going to share uh, a bit some information about Manipur so we can put into context who we are uh, where we are going and where we are coming uh, from. Basically, let's say we are a Belgium-based company. Let me share uh, the screen. And our main activity is container uh, shipping. So everything we do, it's related to container shipping, air freight, sea freight. Is it, uh, let's say, okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Just to put it into context and um, <clears throat> and perspective, uh, we will share some basic information of uh, of Manuport, who uh, who we are. Basically, we are a Belgian based uh, let's say company, a service provider, with let's say uh, offices all over uh, the world. In total, we are over seven hundred uh, people. And uh, we have 40 offices all over the world. We are part of uh, a group. We are stock. Uh, we are owned by stock-listed uh, private equity uh, funds, 
And this also gives us a different, let's say, way of working than other players uh, in our uh, segments. We are not that big, such as DHL, QDNAGO, but we still have a global uh, presence and we have a yearly uh, turnover around 1 billion uh, US dollars. And uh, let's say our main activity is the container shipping, where we do around 500,000 uh, containers uh, a year. It, this is uh, export, import globally, and they're not only connected to Brazil, US, but all over uh, the globe. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, where we are located. Euroports, it's our mother company. It's a terminal uh, operator uh, located in Belgium, in Europe, sorry. And uh, with that, let's say, coverage, this is how we serve our customers. Basically, our approach is uh, to pretty much uh, act together with, uh, with the customers and also share a liability and give advice to where uh, in the direction we should go uh, logistics. Uh, just to give you some, uh, let's say, information of uh, what we do, uh, this is, uh, these are the services we, we provide. Ocean Freight is our, let's say, key business uh, today together with uh, Air Freight. Then, of course, we have all the accessorial services, such as road transportation, repacking, warehousing. The liquids, it's something very important to us. Uh, liquids, uh, to, to share with you what it is, it's mainly the ISO tanks and flexi tank uh, shipping and also thank uh, storage because we do it in several countries as well, including USA and, uh, and Brazil. In, uh, in US, we are located in, uh, in Miami and uh, New York, and we are opening up a new office now in June in Houston because that's where all the chemicals and the liquid companies are, uh, are located. Well, with that said, we can step in, let's say, uh, the funny part now, which is, let's say, the logistics uh, challenge, how uh, we are going to be in the next years, where we are uh, coming from. This, uh, let's say, chart here below is pretty much similar to what, uh, let's say, uh, Maori has uh, shared, uh, except that this is uh, connected to Brazil to US. The chart between, let's say, Brazil to other countries and from US to other countries was pretty much uh, similar with different, let's say, uh, values, uh, of course. This is going back actually since uh, March 19. So we are talking about uh, four years uh, time. As we can uh, see before, uh, let's say, uh, COVID, market was pretty stable and it was pretty much connected to offer and, uh, and demand. The procurement uh, people, which most of the time are responsible for uh, choosing the service provider, were pretty much, let's say, concentrating and uh, trying to do, uh, let's say, uh, the best possible rates and freight level. So uh, the idea of, uh, of shipping was how can I get the best rates and make, uh, let's say, more comp my company more competitive in the business. But when COVID, uh, let's say, uh, hit, this changed pretty much because it was not anymore about having uh, the goods rate. It was about getting uh, space. It was about shipping uh, the cargo. And in, like, uh, in, a, in a difficult environment like we were facing for, uh, let's say, more than two years, we have to balance what is the real, let's say, important thing because is it to have the, be to have the best rate or that's, to, or that's uh, to get the goods shipped because after all, if we don't ship, we cannot uh, invoice, we cannot produce. We have seen many, uh, let's say, different industries to face uh, huge disruptions. The costs have, have risen uh, crazy, like we never uh, uh, saw uh, before, like we never seen before. And we still, let's say, um, we still face a challenge coming from COVID and there will be, of course, new challenges uh, coming. If let's say we go, for instance, in the, in the shipping uh, industry, it's uh, not everything is, uh, is bad. After all, uh, for the shipping, for the container business, it was uh, kind of good news. Why? Because the world kind of uh, stopped. Supply chains have been uh, disrupted uh, all over the world. But one thing that kept going with no, let's say, uh, well, with a lot of drama, but we could see how important this was. It was the container uh, shipping because everyone needed uh, container uh, everywhere. 
the kind of flows with medical stuff, COVID related problem, building stuff, uh, let's say it was, it was crazy. The increase of uh, demand uh, we saw and the capacity was not there. This is, let's say, uh, one of the main reasons why we could see such, let's say, uh, high rates uh, in uh, shipping like never, uh, never before. And uh, of course, we had a, a lot of winners and losers during uh, the pandemic. And then we come to what is, uh, let's say, uh, the challenge of, uh, of the future, what is really important. And that's, let's say, uh, open for discussion and how we are going to see uh, the future in, uh, in shipping. Uh, these are basic uh, topics that we, we will share some ideas how we see as a, as a group uh, the shipping guarantee. What is the shipping guarantee that we have been seeing quite often in big uh, contracts? We are talking about uh, worldwide players such as uh, Suzano, Electrolux, BISF, uh, really the big, uh, the big companies, uh, Dow Chemical, uh, the big companies, uh, different than what has been done in the past. Companies have decided to eventually pay more, but to have guaranteed the cargo will be shipped and also make long-term deals, which before was not uh, the case. In the past, let's say a long-term contract was a one-year uh, deal. Nowadays, we are facing and we are seeing a lot of deals of two, three years with some triggers connected to oil and uh, other, uh, other factors. And companies are actually increasing their shipping costs, but they are making sure they are going to ship and they are going to delivery. So of course, this is uh, always kind of timing and uh, the way you bet it. But let's say after all, uh, companies have realized shipping the goods, it is still more important than having a good and a cheap uh, rate. Uh, with that said, also some other points have come into the discussion, like uh, financing, logistic services, and also the cost of uh, money for the customers and uh, inventory. Because everybody knows inventory, it's a uh, like high inventory, it's a bad uh, KPI. So today we have seen, uh, let's say, some companies where they put all the inventory and cost of logistics on the back of uh, the forwarder. This has become, uh, let's say, we are seeing it a lot. We have several projects on that, uh, let's say, uh, direction, which is, uh, let's say, uh, disturbing. And uh, it makes us uh, thinking on a different way. Because before, when a customer was asking us to finance uh, the full supply chain and saying, ah, I will only pay you when I need the goods, we were basically saying we are afraid for order, we are not a bank. Nowadays, uh, this is happening quite a lot that we put money upfront for the customers and we only get paid when the customers use the cargo. So we have several examples uh, like this in-house. This is kind of, uh, of new, but for the customer, why, why it's important? Because they don't have inventory and stock on their balance sheets. So that means uh, the KPI and the EBITDA of the customers will be better. Of course, there is a cost for it. They have to pay for the financing and uh, everything. But as a logistics provider, this will change uh, the future, I guess, because uh, for the big volumes and for the big, uh, let's say, players, the ones who are establishing and uh, giving the direction of the business, we will only be able to work for those guys when we have a strong and uh, huge financial, uh, let's say, group behind us. Because uh, to give you an idea, we have uh, we do this for Electrolux and we are talking about approximately uh, 25, 20, uh, 20, 25 to $30 million we have to put, uh, let's say, uh, up front just to keep the supply chain uh, going. Of course, this is not only uh, Brazil, it's uh, several, let's say, uh, uh, countries uh, involved, but basically we ship all kinds of goods and we only get paid when the goods go into the production line, which sometimes is very quick because they are late and sometimes it takes uh, like uh, ages before, uh, let's say, uh, the money is coming. So this will be um, a game changer in the logistics uh, world. 
not everybody will be able to to do but that's a way customers uh, let's say are sharing their liability and their finance risk with a service provider the next uh, topic which will be very sensitive and it's happening already it's uh, regarding environment because uh, as we see with uh, electric uh, cars the same happens with the vessels and with the airplanes because uh, okay a lot of containers go uh, on a vessel but the vessel is polluting quite uh, let's say extremely and um, the fleet we have today it's not uh, up to date uh, there is uh, a lack of uh, of capacity not exactly right now but during the pandemic we see this can turn around uh, very quickly and in the past in the next uh, years there will be a lot of extra capacity into the markets will the freight go down because of extra capacity no because the way the fleet will have to to, to turn to to work will be different due to emissions so that means uh, we will need more capacity and more vessels to do the same volume as today so we are seeing it already with uh, the new IMO IMO regulations and when the 20 uh, the IMO 2023 regulation will be uh, implemented next year this will also have uh, let's say uh, an impact on the full uh, let's say on the global uh, supply chain on a global uh, scale and last but not uh, let's say uh, less important that's the challenge i think every industry is facing i would say uh, the world's let's say a most complicated issue uh, nowadays it's uh, people how to attract people how to retain people and uh, let's say uh, how to have good people on boards to deal with uh, with this uh, let's say these are i would say uh, the four very crucial points that will change uh, let's say uh, the logistics in the coming uh, year together with our uh, let's say new technologies which will also have a huge impact on the way we do business and on the way we control uh, supply chains so we thank you uh, very much happy to have a similar vision than my uh, colleague uh, Maori and uh, later on we'll be happy to answer uh, your questions regarding uh, let's say container shipping uh, or worldwide thank you thank you David Chan so Jai please could you share your vision please of course uh, being the last one uh, one thing that I know is going to be that I'm going to be the most informal one uh, thank you Edson for the invitation thank you BA CCF for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I will start off saying that um, I have one blessing and one challenge in my life. The blessing is my two kids and my wife. Um, my wife is my uh, business partner, so I'll reinforce that's a blessing, not a challenge. And my challenge is that I should really stand out in this industry that uh, after COVID, it's a completely different industry. So. What we do, we are a free forwarder. I'm gonna take the opportunity to share my screen too. Very simple one. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, we are specialized in domestic international shipping, warehousing, fulfillment, and customs broker. Yeah. Uh, we do the approach a little bit different. Um, I'll give an example. Our team is set up as uh, squads, not departments, bringing more ownership, bringing more collaboration, and giving outside customers a uh, better customer experience. For more information, definitely you, I encourage you to visit our social media for more information. Um, exploring today's subject, right? I wanted to um, step back, and I know a lot of the audience today is not really from the industry, and answer the question, from a free forwarding perspective, what really happened during COVID? Right? What we see is pricing um, increasing in all of the products, delays. So I wanted to explore and give more clarification on really, really happened. So uh, when we decided to do a home office and there was no option, I really like coffee. So I went online to purchase a coffee machine. And I like espresso, so it was in a specific machine. The initial lead time was 
um, 30 days, it was acceptable due to all the circumstances. After 30 days, no machine. After 60 days, again, no machine. And after 90 days, I had to reach out to the supplier saying that I, what's going on. And he comes back with a question, do you know what's going on in the supply chain industry? I said, yes, I know. So um, I'm living that every, every day, every hour. So after six months, unfortunately, I had to cancel it. So imagine yourself and try to visualize that uh, your neighbor, your entire city, the entire country, the entire world is doing the same thing at the same time. So that's why this massive demand for products, the global supply chain, we were not ready for that. There was no preparation for that. So that's why we, we saw a huge backlog in the factory. We see delays in the transportation and we see the bottleneck in airports and terminals. So I see companies searching for solutions and I see examples here, for example, Maori from Acme doing nearshoring, which we see a lot from big uh, industry. We see Davidson uh, applying more long-term relationship than just spot rates. And let's get an example also from the Port of Los Angeles. Right? Port of Los Angeles decided to do an operation 24 seven. Did that really work out? Maybe yes, maybe no, okay? Because again, this entire industry, you don't maneuver overnight or in a couple of weeks, right? You need a huge preparation and we need every single step of the supply chain to step up. So the port worked 24 seven, but did the trucking company work 24 seven? Did the warehouse work 24 seven? This collaboration, in my opinion, um, it didn't really work out, okay? So moving forward, what I see as a couple of solutions for our industry, definitely not work separate, but work more in a collaboration. Okay, the freight forwarders need good vendors. We're talking about good shipping lines, good uh, airlines collaborating with us. Industry, you guys need uh, freight forwarders collaborating with you. And then I'll touch bases what Lucas told us, it's about visibility, okay? So in February, I participated in a very interesting, biggest innovation trade show in our industry. And the most used word was, we don't have visibility. So how do we bring visibility and dreaming big? Can we get to a Uber experience in our industry? where you have the cell phone, you have on your palm of your hand, the visibility of in real time, where the cargo is and when this is gonna arrive. Right? So um, one of the uh, uh, comments from US Department of Transportation was, okay, those big players, shipping lines, they do have all the data but do, do they really share and do a collaboration with us? I don't, I, I don't think that happened, okay? Though, so I believe collaboration will be key for the future. Uh, and definitely investment in technology. It wasn't so long ago that uh, we implemented pay cargo for payments before it was all checks, right? Bringing all uh, a huge inefficiency. Um, we have to invest a lot and I wanted to bring this AI reality nowadays to us to bring some of the challenges for the future. The question here is AI will really replace humans. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Or that's my opinion, AI will come to merge with humans and enhance our abilities for our daily tasks. Okay. 
how am, am I applying at KC? For example, I get my pricing team. I have seven people in my pricing team doing 250 quotations monthly. It's very manual, but with the AI, I'll be able to bump it up to maybe a thousand quotations a month, 24 seven. And I have my humans working in collecting feedbacks, negotiating rates, and getting alternatives to our customers. So that's our approach when it comes to AI and the future. Okay. So very straightforward. That's my uh, presentation and comments about today's lab. Thank you, Jai. So now we have a few minutes uh, to the end of the webinar. We have some questions, but before we, I would like to invite Lohani for as a new executive director to do the first question. Lohan, please lay first. Sure, thank you everyone for the presentations. Uh, my question is directed to Lucas. Uh, how I know you talked a lot about how to build um, supply chain resilience, but how do we measure that? How do we measure supply chain resilience? Just for one second. The answer, please, just for one minute, because we have a few minutes to end of the webinar, please. Yeah, I think Lohan, thanks a lot. This is this is a really good question. Obviously, th there's a lot of KPIs to be measured, but I would uh, I would tackle your answer in, in three in uh, in three directions. I think the first one is is time to survive, right? How long does it take to reopen your business? Uh, the second one would be time to recover. So how long does it take to recover your backlog? And I think the third one is how you are able to success and pass through. And in, in, in I think I would call time to thrive. Right? How, how, how are you doing on, on post-crisis? I think this could be uh, three, three good KPIs to measure how resilient is uh, your organization. All right. So my question that, that I you. have is for Mauri. Mauri, what's the impact for the COVID in, in your sense in 2020? For me, is a, is a, I would like to know, I'm very curious about that. Well, obviously, in uh, 2020, uh, which was in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had a, a hard hit on our sales, but uh, we were able to overcome this pretty quickly. And uh, I would say that uh, by the end of 2020, we were recovering and we lost kind of 30% of our sales since March of 2020 up to October and November but we were able to recover uh, pretty quickly, mainly in the automotive industry, which is, is pretty important for us uh, in, in South America, not in China, but here in, in North America and in South American automotive industry is quite important for us. And obviously they shut down most of their facilities or, or all of their facilities, right? So we had a big impact, but due to our uh, business model, we were able to recover uh, quite, uh, rapidly and uh, yes, that's that's how I would put it. All right, thank you, Marie. Lohan, can you please uh, for another question for David, please? Sure, sure. He, Davidson, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the impact of IMO between 2020 and 2023 in the shipping industry? Uh, yes, well, actually, that's a very let's say. Uh, I don't dare to say tough question, but that's very uncertain what is going to happen still, because basically the IMO, uh, the IMO 2020, it was about sulfur uh, emissions, which was, let's say, uh, pre-agreed quite uh, upfront. So when COVID uh, hit, this was kind of uh, well uh, prepared by the shipping lines, even if it was very unknown how to do it. But when we are talking about uh, next year, IMO 2023, it's basically about carbon emissions. So the point is, this was, let's say, the regulations were made uh, by people who, which are very different than the people building the vessels and the people dealing with uh, shipping, which means some of the new vessels will be fully prepared for uh, the regulations, but all the existing fleet is still not there. That means the vessels will have to, uh, let's say, uh, to go slower. So extra vessels will be needed 
uh, be needed to do the same quantity of uh, cargo. And let's say if we take, uh, let's say, uh, Asia US, we are talking about 12, 13 vessels in the loop. So uh, with one sailing a week, if we have to comply with EMO 2023, the same loop, we will need two or three extra vessels because vessels will have to go slower to pollute less. So uh, the extra capacity that will be brought in, will it be enough for the higher demands uh, which we should expect in the coming uh, 20 years? If we are talking about shipping expectation in the next 25 years, it's expected we have a growth in volume of 80%. The fleet will be uh, will be there, but the fleet will not be able to uh, let's say act as they are supposed to. So, will they put a lot of vessels in the draw uh, the dry uh, yards to let's say adapt the vessels, which means again supply chain disruption. Uh, will let's say uh, we have to just keep going with the vessels as they are polluting as uh, let's say. Uh, they can and not comply with the regulations. So there will be, uh, let's say, uh, good impacts uh, in the future, not right now, but in the coming, let's say, after five years, because the fleets which we have uh, ongoing nowadays, it's not capable to comply with uh, the regulations which we are, uh, let's say, uh, we have to uh, work for. That's, that's, okay, that's David, a challenge. Thank you. So Jai, I have a one last question for you. You said that you went to the trade show in Las Vegas, right? So this is a question for $1 million. What do you be the biggest transformation logistics industry five years from now? Good. I'll answer the a million question, a million dollar question. So it was very interesting, like I said, and um, the logistics industry in terms of technology, I, I would say we are just getting out of a cave. Uh, there are a lot to do in terms of technology, a lot to do in terms of visibility, automation. So startup companies, they detected all those inefficiencies and they are working hard to bring a lot of different and great solutions. So expect um, digital free forwarders to show up more and a lot of technology to help us to perform better to give a better customer experience to the shippers. All right. So now is the time that it will do, do like to, to talk and Rohan for any, any, any. There is one question here in the chat is directly to Jai. What are the major challenges faced by FF with shipping lines and airlines? And what is FMC and logistics associations doing to negotiate um, doing to negotiate better terms. Okay, I'm gonna start from the second one. I know FMC stepped up, uh, especially to control um, the extra costs, the mortgages and the storages that was charged. That was causing a big negative impact to the shippers. Now, when it comes to the challenge for the shipping lines and airlines, um, the world changed for, for them too, right? Uh, we see, for example, a different kind of airline being created right? uh, where you really don't need humans to, to pilot. Right? So I believe technology will hit big time uh, on their side too, and they're preparing for that. So people, uh, we haven't done have a time because it's more than two hours and then we still have one review. question on the, one question, the last one. Go yeah. ahead. You have a time. All right. Lohani, please, you first. The question is I'm opening here. Um, in your opinion, how prepared are companies today to implement machine learning solutions that can help them predict potential problems in their operations and outline strategies? to mitigate these risks. Of the total annual expenditure on R&D, do you see companies dedicating a relevant percentage to artificial intelligence supply to supply chain and logistics? And I'm not sure um, to whom the, 
the question is directed to. But feel free to answer, guys. I can take this one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the data of how much companies they have actually been investing, but I do believe that uh, this is going to be one of the areas that where they will allocate a lot of uh, uh, their budget on on bringing together AI technology and connecting with data driven and how they can they can <clears throat> increase resilience in their their operations. That's for sure. All right. People, I would like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you for Brazilian America Chamber of Commerce of Florida to host this webinar. Thank you for Lucas, Mauri, Jai, and Davidson. Thank you very much. Yeah, Bye. thank you everyone. So it was a great presentation. We look forward to your feedback. Uh, thank you to the members that participated. Thank you to the uh, presentations and um, we hope to greet you in some of other events. Thank we will, uh, thank, for the other questions, so we will send to the speakers and they will reply directly to, mm -hmm. to, your, to you, Valte, okay? Thank you everyone, have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.